Today I want to talk to you about denial in narcissists. It's a very common problem when dealing with narcissistic people, and it's a large part of what drives them, so I thought we'd talk about it on the show today. Narcissists are all different in some ways, but one thing virtually all of them have in common is denial. They operate under a huge amount of denial. It's one of the central functions of the defense mechanism that we know as narcissism. Narcissistic people generally experience large amounts of self-hatred and shame. Their emotions are out of control and disproportionate to the situation a lot of the time, which is usually experienced as frightening or as weakness, which they absolutely loathe. They generally haven't learned how to regulate or control their emotions, so they're not able to soothe themselves when they get upset. The result of this, the reaction to this, is the only defense they have against this ever-boiling cauldron of emotion, denial. This denial is very important. In order to keep the self-hatred and pathological shame that most of them feel at bay, they must combat that. Denial works as far as it goes, but it isn't enough. To simply deny who you are creates a vacuum, because then you're nobody. To counteract that, you have to then create something new to put in its place. That is where the false self comes in. It's a monument to the narcissist denial. It is the counterpart to every negative thing the pathologically narcissistic person secretly believes themselves to be. It is the shining, perfect, beautiful facade designed to keep the ugly hidden one under wraps. Without this facade, they have no armor against the self-hatred and the shame that they feel. It consumes them very quickly if it can break through that facade, and what often follows is decompensation, or what some call collapsing. Collapsing can lead to psychosis and even suicide. It is very serious. This is why penetrating the denial of pathologically narcissistic people is so difficult. It is essential to their very existence. Their coping strategy is set up in such a way that they never have to accept anything that's hurtful or that feels like blame. It does not penetrate the armor. This is why they turn and twist and deflect and project. Imagine those old cartoons where the guy contorts himself into crazy positions using a frying pan to deflect all the bullets back to the shooter. This is what the narcissistic person is doing. However far outside the bounds of reality or credulity they have to go doesn't matter. What matters is deflecting the threat. Any criticism or blame opens a doorway to that barely restrained self-hatred and shame. That's why you see the rage. That's why they feel attacked. It's like a dam that's about to burst. There are cracks in it now and more and more water is starting to trickle through. The pathologically narcissistic person can feel that trickle. They can feel the pressure behind the wall and they're panicking because their denial cannot hold on in the face of facts. What's on the other side of that terrifies them. Denial can be very powerful, but it's also a fragile coping mechanism for pathologically narcissistic people. There's a thin wall between the narcissist and the things they want to escape, and it's fractured pretty easily, probably because they are aware they're hiding something. When this happens, you will often see various types of devaluation. Rage, hysterics, suicide attempts, silent treatments, ghosting and discarding, and more. Not only are these things a warning to the threat to back off, but when you deny something, you make it more powerful. The more afraid you are of something, the more you hide from it, the more power you give it. Imagine how powerful these things are then, considering the sheer amount of time and energy the narcissistic person has put into denying them for their entire life. It probably feels like a monster inside of them, and ironically, that's often exactly how it comes out. Narcissistic people face these threats to their denial constantly because they can't avoid reality completely. They may appear delusional, but they are not psychotic, and even the most clever reframing in the world simply cannot mitigate all the facts all the time. Sometimes some things get through. It's a never-ending battle on their part then to shore up the cracks in the dam so that they don't drown. They are good at it, but contrary to their beliefs, nobody's perfect. When denial of something is no longer possible, often serious depression can occur. They may break down and collapse under the strain. This is often when they will reach out to others with their threats of hurting themselves or feelings of abandonment, rejection, and despair. Because pathologically narcissistic people cannot regulate or create their own self-worth, they have to extract it from other people, usually using the false self. If they cannot use the false self, such as in times of collapse, what you will often see is a heavily filtered version of the true self. A cataclysmically depressed wreck of a person. A child who does not know how to function in this world. It's a sad irony that instead of using this stolen self-worth to actually build true self-worth to engender acceptance of themselves, they use it to rebuild the dam and strengthen their denial. Instead of fixing the problem, they're actually reinforcing it and making it worse. 
It's perhaps one of the most valuable lessons we can learn from narcissistic people, the importance of living authentically and being honest with ourselves. Yes, accepting things can be painful. However, what we don't accept, we cannot change. And what we deny eventually ends up running our lives. Be honest with yourself and face the struggle. Change is never easy, but it can be so worth it. Honesty is the first step to that. Today I wanted to talk to you about how pathologically narcissistic people are always in survival mode. If you are dealing with a narcissistic person, this is very important to understand, so I thought we could address it on the show today. People often ask why so many pathologically narcissistic people don't seem to think of the long-term consequences of their behavior. While this is a multifaceted answer, part of the reason for that is because they are in survival mode. When you're in survival mode, you are not thinking of two years from now, or two months from now, or even two days from now. All you're focusing on is right now. And the crisis happening right now, getting your needs met right now. Consequences are secondary in survival mode. We can't worry about consequences right now because all that matters right now is surviving. If at some point in the future we are no longer in survival mode, maybe we can think about the consequences then. The problem is that doesn't happen. There is no future. There's only now and the endless crisis of need. People dealing with pathologically narcissistic loved ones often feel like they're stuck in Groundhog Day where it's just the same thing over and over and over again. There's always a problem. There's always a crisis. There's always an emergency. Or conversely, there's never a crisis and never an emergency because the narcissistic person doesn't care about anything at all. The narcissist never seems to get tired of this. It's like they don't even realize it. And it's safe to say they probably don't. To them, it seems that every day is a fresh horror filled with losses and landmines and the desperate search for self-worth and fulfillment. The focus is on just making it through day-to-day -day life. This is something that many of them have a huge amount of difficulty with and their coping mechanisms are primitive at best. This is one reason why they are so results or reward driven no matter what the cost. For a narcissistic person, the ends justify the means. They're just trying to survive. They need what they need and anyone or anything that gets in their way is expendable. If you were starving and you needed to steal food to eat so that you didn't die, you would do that. You wouldn't care that you were breaking the law and you wouldn't care about the situation of the person you were stealing it from. In survival mode, all that matters is your own life. This is how they see things. Their mindset is such that they have to do these things to survive and when someone exists in that mentality, nothing is off limits. The problem is, narcissists are in survival mode, but they are not in a survival situation. There's no competition for resources, no need to fear that their survival is in question, yet they conduct themselves as if these things are true. They behave as if there are nonstop imminent threats to their well-being, especially to their emotional well-being. It's not unlike the particular type of food aggression that we see in dogs that have been neglected and starved. This is not the only cause of food aggression in dogs, of course, but it is a legitimate one. If a dog was in an abusive situation long enough, he will have learned that food resources are not stable or reliable. Food might be available now, but it could become scarce at any time, and this puts the dog's survival in jeopardy. Because of this, he will gobble any food he's given or that he finds as fast as possible, and if someone tries to take the food away, the dog will growl and he will bite in order to protect his resource. This dog is in survival mode. He doesn't know when or if his next meal will ever come, so he feels an urgency and an anxiety about food all the time. He has learned that he cannot trust in a reliable source of food, therefore he secures as much as he can, as fast as he can, and if anyone interferes, even people that he loves, they will be dealt with aggressively. Another dog that tries to eat the food or dares to even come near it will be attacked or maybe even killed. This is how the dog attempts to cope with what he has learned about life. Survival mode takes over so that his needs can be met. He's attempting to protect and secure his resources because he doesn't know if he's ever going to have them again. Humans are not all that different from this. We learn things the same way, and we are imprinted by previous experiences the same way, especially early ones. Narcissists don't know when or if their needs will ever be met, and they believe they are helpless to attend to those needs on their own, so they feel a continuous urgency and an anxiety about their needs all the time. Their constant focus is, what about me? 
for whatever reason, early on, they seem to have learned that they cannot rely on other people to care about them, and they have compensated for this by focusing exclusively on their own needs to the exclusion and the detriment of everything else in the panicked belief that not to do so means these needs will never be met. This results in narcissistic people attaching astronomical importance to their own needs and perceiving any deviation from this as an attack and a rejection. Unable to attend to their own needs, they insist that others attach the same importance to their needs that they do. When this doesn't happen, it reinforces the idea that they are in a fight for their survival. No one will care about me if I don't care about myself. No one will care about my needs if I don't make them care. No one will recognize my needs if I don't force them to recognize my needs. Of course, in a healthy relationship of any kind, this is not necessary. However, the pathologically narcissistic person generally does not recognize this. They are locked into a certain way of being, a certain mode of operation. They know no other way to be, and to abandon that would be tantamount to saying their needs don't matter at all. For most narcissists, the only way they see out of survival mode is death. The idea that there is another way to live is totally foreign to them. It's like if someone was trying to tell you to breathe through your ears. It sounds preposterous, and more than that, it sounds impossible. To the pathologically narcissistic person, it also sounds like a trick. You're trying to get them to stop focusing on their needs so that their needs are not met. Now, it seems easy enough to fix this, right? Just show them that they're not in a survival situation and that they're safe. Poof, survival mode disengaged. But it's not that easy. All facts that support positive interactions with people are either twisted, reframed, or ignored by the narcissist's perception and the way that their mind works. All facts that support negative interaction and threats to survival are maximized, misperceived, and exploited. This is what happens when someone is hyper-focused on their own needs and is unable to focus on anything else. Everything is perceived as being about or to or because of themselves. There's also the matter of being unable to attend to their own needs. This is a cause of huge anxiety and alarm in pathologically narcissistic people. Again, we can look to our example of the abused dog. He cannot secure his own source of nourishment. He must wait for someone to give it to him. If he could get out of his cage, perhaps he could find his own food, but this is beyond his ability. He must simply wait, pathetically at the mercy of other people's whims. It is the same for the pathologically narcissistic person. If they could get out of the, quote, cage of their defense mechanisms and circular logic, perhaps they would realize that they can do things like self-soothe and create self-worth on their own for themselves. But for whatever reason, they cannot get out. They feel that they're like that abused dog, waiting for someone to bring whatever scraps they feel like throwing. And more often than not, in the narcissist's perception, no one comes. They are resentful of this, and even more resentful of the fact that they're relying on other people in the first place. The very fact that this has to happen underscores and accentuates their perceived weakness. If you are dealing with a pathologically narcissistic person, remember that you are likely dealing with someone who believes they are in a daily struggle for survival, who believes they are in resource competition with any and everybody around them, and who is mightily resentful of this fact. They believe that everything they do is justified because of these things. When you are just trying to survive, how can you be blamed for anything that you have done? How could you do any differently? And for the narcissistic person, everything leads back to survival. Their manipulations, their lies, their rage, their false self, everything. This is why everything is such a big deal. Even stupid things that appear to have no connection to survival at all are very significant to the pathologically narcissistic person. Every time they are told no or denied anything, it reinforces the idea that they are in this alone and must fight tooth and nail for everything they get against a world that is literally trying to kill them. Every time they are asked to consider another person, it reinforces the idea that they're unimportant and worthless. Every time someone will not buy into their projections and their false image, it reinforces the idea that they are too damaged to be loved or to matter. Small things have huge implications in the mind of the pathologically narcissistic person. The fiction that they depend on is so fragile that even the tiniest thing could upset the whole structure and down it goes. This is something that represents literal death in the mind of many pathologically narcissistic people and something they will avoid at all costs. If you are dealing with a narcissistic person, realize that the stakes are very high for them in everything. This is not a game where they can allow any other winner but themselves. If Fox is chasing Rabbit, who's going to run faster? 
Rabbit, because Fox is only running for his dinner. Rabbit is running for his life. Today I wanted to talk to you about narcissists and jealousy. This is an extremely common issue people have when dealing with pathologically narcissistic persons, so I thought we could address it on the show today. Jealousy is a pretty common thing. It's a natural reaction to low self-esteem or problems with the way a person views themselves. In narcissistic people, this is no different. The difference is in the way the narcissist feels about themselves. If you have slightly low self-esteem, you might be a little jealous in some situations. If you have none at all, you will be extremely jealous in every situation. This is the problem for pathologically narcissistic people. Most of us have been jealous at some point or another. Maybe somebody had something that you wish you had, or maybe your significant other was unfaithful with somebody. It's usually pretty specific for most people, and it often relates to the normal competitiveness that people feel in different situations or relationships. Narcissists, though, are jealous of everybody over everything. Most seem to believe that everyone else has everything they don't, and they are usually extremely envious and resentful of that. For example, a narcissistic mother may be jealous of her daughter because she believes the daughter is prettier, more successful, gets more attention, has better relationships, or any number of other things that the mother is insecure about. However, whereas most people would simply mull over this type of jealousy internally because they are embarrassed of it, the narcissistic mother may actually attempt to sabotage the daughter so that she's no longer perceived as more successful in these areas. To a narcissist, every situation is a competition with other people that they need to win, even when that person is their own child. Narcissistic people believe that it's unfair for others to have things that they don't have. There was a fairly recent case where a woman killed her upstairs neighbors by setting their apartment on fire, killing both them and the three children in there with them. She was jealous because they had a happy relationship and she did not. Rather than improve her own life, this undoubtedly narcissistic person chose instead to destroy the happiness and even the very lives of those who she felt had it better than she did. This is a very common theme for narcissistic people. Why should others be happy while they are suffering? These people were killed simply to make this obviously narcissistic person feel better about herself. Their lives meant absolutely nothing to her. They had no value except for how they made her feel. For most people, jealousy means to envy. For pathologically narcissistic people, jealousy often means to destroy. Just like with any other person, jealousy happens because pathologically narcissistic people feel inadequate. The problem is that they feel inadequate in every way about everything, and they believe they are entitled to destroy things or people because of that. Because narcissists cannot create or sustain self-worth, every bit of it has to come from other people, either directly through attention or indirectly through contests where they compare themselves to others and come out the winner. This is a reflexive coping mechanism designed to combat the feelings of pathological self-hatred and shame that pathologically narcissistic people have internalized and often deny. Anytime they are not the winner of these constant contests they create with other people, that self-hatred and shame shows its face and the narcissist has to take action in order to avoid, deny, or silence it. This is usually when they attempt to neutralize the object they believe is creating the problem for them, the thing they're jealous of. For example, narcissists that are jealous of attention, support, or sympathy others get may engage in smear campaigns designed to ruin that person's good reputation in order to destroy that support, sympathy, or attention. Narcissists jealous of co-workers may set them up to fail, tell lies about them, or endeavor to get them fired. Narcissists that are jealous of another person's possessions may steal these possessions or ruin them. A narcissistic person that is insecure in a relationship may appear jealous by continuously accusing the other person of infidelity and of having interest in other people. They may also attempt to destroy their partner's confidence or control them in an effort to prevent the partner from finding someone else and leaving. As with anyone else, a narcissist's jealousy is an expression of problems with self-worth. It's extreme jealousy compared to most people because their lack of self-worth is extreme compared to most people. Their attempts to destroy, control, or sabotage situations, things, and people they're jealous of, while harmful and even dangerous, are really nothing more than the narcissist saying, I'm not good enough. I cannot compete in this situation because I am no good. Jealousy in pathologically narcissistic people can also result in projection of these feelings, where in order to cope with their feelings of jealousy, they accuse others of being jealous of them. 
A narcissist that is jealous of your success may accuse you of being jealous of their efforts or of trying to sabotage them. This happens because they are envious of you and not only do they believe you would do something like that because they would do something like that, but because feeling jealous of others stems from not feeling good enough which triggers shame and rage in narcissists. The only way they have to combat that is to create a defensive scenario where they can try to believe other people are jealous of them. I'm not jealous, I'm not weak, I'm not inadequate, you are. You're jealous of how great I am or how great I'm going to be. This is pitiful to some and maddening to others, but as with everything about narcissistic people, you can't take it personally. In the end, it's really not even about you. It's about them and their never-ending quest to validate themselves at the expense of other people. It's important not to get caught in the cycle of trying to help narcissists with their self-worth problems by attempting to prove to them that they're wrong. It makes sense to do that, and with non-narcissistic people, it might work, but with pathologically narcissistic people, it's usually a waste of time. Regardless of what they say or who they blame, these feelings of self-hatred, shame, and their lack of self-worth are not the result of anything anybody is doing to them now. They have been a part of the narcissist's internal makeup for years and years and years. This is not a situation that can be fixed with reassurance and you will only exhaust yourself trying. People who have been involved with narcissists for extended periods of time already know there's nothing you can say or do to convince a narcissist of anything. It just doesn't matter. Everything you do will be twisted into proof that validates what they already feel and what they already believe, even if it makes no sense at all. State your truth by all means, but don't exhaust yourself by repeatedly explaining and defending yourself against things that didn't happen, motives you don't have, and emotions you don't feel. There's just no way to prove something to somebody who is unable or unwilling to believe it. Today I wanted to talk to you about the way narcissists act, or rather react. As listeners of the show know, most narcissists are ruled by their emotions. Many people think narcissists don't have emotions. That's not true at all. It's true that most narcissists have no feelings for other people, but it's a misconception to believe this means they have no feelings at all. Emotions, in fact, color everything they see and do, often to the point that their perception of reality is totally distorted. Of course, that makes sense. Emotions are not logical or factual. They're not right or wrong. They just are. Most people realize that, but the majority of narcissists do not. They believe feelings are facts. I feel it, therefore it's true. Because narcissism is characterized as a failure to distinguish the self from the external world, and because they find their own emotions so overwhelming, narcissists often experience their feelings as alien or as coming from somewhere other than themselves. If I feel bad, someone or something must be making me feel bad. This is the crux of how they deal with the world. Most narcissists perceive the world as hostile, threatening, and negative, which is no surprise considering that's the emotional lens they're viewing the world through. Negative emotions like hate, shame, feeling rejected, these are very powerful. People usually react pretty strongly to them, and the narcissist is no different. The difference is that while most people react appropriately to actual events that really happen, narcissists overreact to their own emotions, which they have projected onto other people. This means they are often perceived to be reacting to things that did not even happen. This is very difficult for loved ones to understand because they often can't see what the narcissist is so upset about. To the narcissist, this looks like a denial of reality and of their feelings, and they become angry. The person's actual feelings are not considered here. It's all about the narcissist and how they feel. And it's not that they're choosing to disregard this person's feelings. It's that they don't understand that other people are separate from themselves. They think their feelings are the other person's feelings. It goes like this. The narcissist experiences a feeling that they find extremely unpleasant, like self-hatred. Narcissism is a byproduct of and a defense mechanism against feelings like that. To make this horrible, crippling feeling easier to deal with, the narcissist projects this feeling onto another person. Now, according to the narcissist, it's no longer their feeling, it's the other person's feeling. I don't hate me, you hate me. It's important to remember that this is not really a conscious thing. It's a reflex, like an automatic deflection. It's like how you would react if someone threw a ball at your face. You would try to swat it away from you without even thinking about it. Even though they realize they hate themselves, they usually don't realize they're projecting. Many of them believe their loved ones really do hate them. This is because that's how they feel about themselves. Again, the other person's actual real life feelings are not considered here. For the narcissist, it's like looking in a mirror. They feel self-hatred and when they look at another person, they simply see that hatred reflected back to them. 
So now the narcissist is sitting here with this awful feeling that they believe is coming from this other person. It's painful, it makes them angry, and they react to that. How dare you hate them when they've done nothing wrong? So they attack the other person, both barrels and guns blazing. It may happen during a very minor disagreement or for no reason at all. To the other person, this looks like they're being attacked over nothing. They're like, what the hell is wrong with this person? Why are they upset? What are they even talking about? So they naturally deny it. No, I don't hate you. And the narcissist gets even angrier. They can feel it. They can feel that hatred. Therefore, it must be real. Their feelings wouldn't lie to them. So obviously, you are lying to them. The more you deny it, the angrier they become. The more you try to explain, the more they accuse you. For example, let's say your narcissistic loved one has fixed something in the house. Maybe it's dinner, maybe it's the front steps, whatever it is. You thank them and say that they did a good job. They accept your thanks and all is well. However, the next thing you know, the narcissist is claiming you said they did a terrible job, that it was sloppy, that they're an idiot, that it's bad just because they did it. All the things they would accuse you of saying or doing. You know it didn't go like that, so not only are you hurt and angry that they're lying about you and that they apparently think you're such a mean, villainous, terrible person that you would say things like that, but you're angry that something you thought was okay is apparently not okay. There's a large element of betrayal there. The truth is, all that's going on here is the narcissist is projecting their own insecurities and self-hatred onto you. What they feel becomes what you said. They are reacting to their own feelings. It really has nothing to do with you at all. They're obviously not satisfied with the job they did, and they are claiming that that's how you feel. Just about everything they do is a reaction. It may look like an action taken with purpose at first, but in reality, nine times out of ten, everything they do is simply a reaction to their own internal feelings. I remember a situation where a narcissist was acting out so badly that the police almost had to be called. Apparently the issue was that the narcissist had been beating themselves up all day because they had checked the mail, forgetting that it was a federal holiday and there was no mail. This caused such a chain reaction of bad feelings that the narcissist had a meltdown. Yes, this sounds very stupid. But to the narcissist in that particular situation, it was just more proof of how stupid, useless, worthless, you know, whatever, that they are. They simply cannot take those kinds of feelings. And when something happens to the narcissist that they believe validates these kinds of feelings, they often just explode. Even those who seem calm, cool, and collected are usually struggling with these kinds of feelings all the time. The narcissist has a brutal superego that assaults them with insults and criticism nonstop. Even the calm, cool, and collected ones. They've just learned to hide that for the majority of the time. They are virtually all reacting to their emotions all the time. The exception to this would be psychopaths who have no real emotions at all. It's not just anger either. A narcissist that cheats is reacting to their own feelings of insecurity or their need for attention. A narcissist that physically attacks other people is reacting to their own feelings of impotence and anger or entitlement. Sometimes you can take the wind out of their sails by not reacting to their provocations and calmly saying, those are your feelings, you are apparently upset with yourself because you don't like the way you fix the front steps or whatever, and you're trying to punish me because you feel bad. Your feelings are your responsibility. I did not say any of that to you. Your feelings are not my feelings. And sometimes this just causes them to rage harder. Denial is a very ugly thing. The purpose of projection is not only to get you to carry these heavy feelings for them, but it's also to get you to attack them in return. This fills the masochistic need for punishment many of them have, as well as validates their self-hatred and their egotistical need to be right, and also it fulfills their need to strike out at somebody so that they can then feel better. They want to fight. They want you to say, yes, that's right. Those front steps look like crap. And of course they do because you fix them and you're a moron. This way they can defend themselves against that and feel better. They may also be looking for you to say, I would never think that. They look great because you're amazing and I love you. They may want both of those things, even though they will believe neither. Sound confusing? Imagine how they feel. They're fighting themselves, a battle with the invisible man, a blind person in a dark room swinging at nobody. The only way to win this game is not to play, because in this game, you're not the other player. You're one of the game pieces. They are playing the game with themselves, and there is no winner. There are only losers. Today I want to talk to you about narcissists and mistakes. It's pretty well known to those who have had to deal with narcissistic people that narcissists don't deal with mistakes very well. Whether you made one or whether they did, there's bound to be a problem over it. But why is it so difficult for them to deal with something that's so common? 
If you're the one who made the mistake, the narcissist may either be crushed that you're not perfect or overjoyed that you've messed up. Either way, you're going to hear about it. It's not uncommon for pathologically narcissistic people to fly into a rage over very minor mistakes, attacking the other person relentlessly and attempting to annihilate their character for something as small as bringing the wrong item from the store or simple forgetfulness. There can be a few reasons for this. Many times it's because the narcissist doesn't actually believe it's a mistake in the first place. They are sure that you have malicious motives. They are certain you've done this thing on purpose to upset, sabotage, or otherwise harm them. They take it as a personal attack and an offense. And of course, any attack on a narcissist will be avenged. If they do believe that it was unintentional, they may still attack or demean people anyway because it's a chance to make themselves feel better. Any flaw or failure on another person's part is an opportunity to elevate themselves and many narcissists will jump at that opportunity. Sometimes narcissistic people will attack loved ones for making mistakes because they can't stand the idea that this person is not perfect. Not only do they feel this reflects badly on them, but a narcissist's idea of love is very immature, unrealistic, and idealized. A partner that is not being devalued and discarded is usually being put on a pedestal. When this perfect partner messes up or fails somehow, this crushes the narcissist. They feel betrayed and tricked and horribly let down. It's not unlike the way a child feels when they're forced to see their parents as ordinary humans before they're ready to understand or accept this fall from grace. It's a very traumatic experience and it usually alters the relationship permanently. And of course, if you are being devalued or have been discarded by the narcissist, then the mistake is just one more thing they can attack you for. Regardless of the reason, narcissists cannot abide mistakes. And if mistakes are difficult to accept from other people, they are intolerable from the narcissist themselves. Everyone who has dealt with a pathological narcissist knows how far they will go not to admit or accept that they've made a mistake. But this denial is a lot more than just not wanting to be wrong. To most people, a simple mistake is usually not that big of a deal. It can be embarrassing depending on the type of mistake, but generally we all understand that everybody makes mistakes. To a narcissist, though, making a mistake, any mistake, is unacceptable. It's unforgivable. Mistakes to the narcissist are the ultimate proof that they are not special or superior, which means that, behind the false self, all the horrible, hateful things they secretly believe about themselves are true. They really are worthless. They really are garbage. They really are stupid. This is, of course, ridiculous. Making a mistake means none of those things. But because of the narcissist's delusional shame and pathological self-hatred, it only takes something small to shatter the illusion they're trying to advance, and that tidal wave of bad feelings comes crashing through. Something as small as not remembering the date can be enough to trigger huge feelings of shame. It sounds absurd to most people, but this is the miserable reality that pathologically narcissistic people are living in. This is why they need to blame their mistakes on other people, and why they go so far not to admit that they've made one. They need an out, a way to nullify and invalidate those bad feelings. If they can't do that, the feelings will overwhelm them and they are unable to deal with that. That's pretty much the reason they do everything, actually. Their life is nothing but one long, constant attempt to escape those horrible, overwhelming feelings. It's why they rage, it's why they lie, it's why they manipulate and gaslight, and why they created a false self in the first place. All of their efforts are all geared towards the same thing. Sadly, it's like trying to hold the ocean back with a broom. The facade of the false self is so fragile that even a very small mistake sends the whole thing crashing down. Imagine if your opinion of yourself were so delusionally negative that making a simple mistake could cause you to decompensate or even to become suicidal if you couldn't blame it on somebody else and were forced to acknowledge it. This is their reality. And this is why relationships with pathologically narcissistic people will always be unfair and abusive. They are literally one small mistake away from total disaster all the time. Today I want to talk to you about whether narcissistic people know the difference between right and wrong. This is something there seems to be some confusion about, so I wanted to address that on the show today. There's a lot of sympathy and support for people with mental illness, and rightfully so. Mental illness can be devastating. Technically speaking, pathologically narcissistic people are mentally ill. They have distorted thinking, impaired perception, and many emotional problems, along with whatever 
other comorbid or co-occurring issues they might have, such as substance abuse, depression, and anxiety or eating disorders. There is often debate about whether someone is responsible for their actions or not when they have a mental illness or a disorder. The point of contention is usually whether this person understands the difference between right and wrong and whether or not they're capable of controlling their behavior. This is a summary of how responsibility is determined legally in a court of law. Does someone understand that what they did was wrong and were they able to control their behavior? In the case of the majority of pathologically narcissistic people, the answer to these questions is yes. Yes, they understand what they've done is generally considered wrong. They don't care. Yes, they can control their behavior. They have chosen not to do so. They will go as far as they feel they can get away with. For example, in a domestic violence situation, it doesn't usually start out with black eyes and broken bones. It starts out with a push or with throwing something at the victim. It starts out with degrading them, with calling them names, things like that. The consequences of this behavior are as yet unknown, so the abuser tests the water to see what will happen. When the victim doesn't end the relationship or impose any real consequences, the abuser becomes bolder and more comfortable with becoming violent. They will just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until either they are hit with serious consequences or the abuser themselves decides it's gone far enough. This could be very far indeed, up to and including the death of the victim. As with any abuse situation, narcissists blame the victim. They say they were provoked that they were baited, that they were abused themselves. It's a common defense for a narcissistic abuser to imply or even flat out say that they cannot control themselves. And this is not just for physical abuse, it's all types of abuse. This is a way of denying responsibility for their actions by blaming the victim or blaming circumstances or basically anything other than themselves. For example, an abuser that is forced to confront their own abusive behavior may defend their actions by saying they were mad about something someone else did or said and then they took it out on the victim because they, quote, couldn't help it. Such as a situation where someone who's angry about something that happened at work takes it out on their spouse or their children. It's funny because it seems like they controlled themselves just fine with the person they claim to actually be upset with. They waited until they got to their victim to suddenly become unable to control themselves. It's a crock. It happens because the consequences of attacking the other person are unknown, but they know there will be no consequences for attacking the victim. It's safer to take their anger out on the victim. There's no risk involved. This is how we know that the majority of pathologically narcissistic people can control their behavior, because they do. If they feel they need to control their behavior, they can do it quite well. For instance, if the police are there, or if they're in court, or if there are people around who the narcissist doesn't want to witness their behavior, that behavior will not occur. Except in cases of very severe stress or upset, the abusive behavior of narcissists will generally only happen when they feel comfortable in the idea that they will not be challenged for it or face consequences. There may be some subtle attempts at covert abuse, like maybe trying to embarrass somebody or attempts at manipulation in front of other people, but generally you don't see the blatant abuse that narcissists are known for if they feel they're in a position where they can't get away with it. This is why some people attempt to record the narcissist without their knowledge because they know they're not going to act that way in front of other people. But does the narcissist know that their behavior is wrong? Well, obviously, if they're trying to hide something, they know somebody's going to think something's wrong with it. Otherwise, why would they bother to hide it? If it's not wrong and everyone will clearly agree with you that it's not wrong, why are you hiding what you're doing? But what about in the broader sense? Do pathologically narcissistic people understand the difference between right and wrong in the broader sense? Yes, they do. Narcissistic people, in general, are not psychotic. They understand the difference between right and wrong. They just don't think the same rules apply to them. For example, yes, it's wrong to steal. It is not wrong for the narcissist to steal, and you should stop overreacting, okay? Because they really needed that thing that they stole, whatever it was. Yes, okay, it's wrong to hit your spouse. It is not wrong for the narcissist to hit their spouse because it's only wrong to hit a normal spouse, a good spouse that is loving and supportive and perfect, you know, like all the other spouses on earth besides you. It's not wrong to hit an evil, manipulative spouse that's trying to ruin your life and provoke you. Anyone would agree with that. 
Yes, it's wrong to abuse your children. It's not wrong for the narcissist to abuse their children because what they are doing is not abuse. Abuse is hurting a child that doesn't deserve it. An evil, hateful, disgusting, despicable child like you were was not being abused because you deserved it. Anybody would agree with that. Of course, if they really believed that anyone would agree with that, they wouldn't be so desperate to make sure nobody finds out about it. The truth is, they know their behavior is wrong, and they understand the concept of right and wrong very well. Many of them consider themselves an authority on what's right, what's wrong, what's fair, what's unfair. They can punish other people for a wrongdoing all day long, and they can go on for days, for years, about the many ways they've been wronged in their life. They understand just fine. They just don't think any of it applies to them because they're pretending to be special. It isn't the rules that pathologically narcissistic people don't understand. It's their own self-importance and their overblown fictional view of their place in the world that's the problem. There's always an excuse for them. There's always a justification or a mitigation. There's always a defense and a reason why what they've done is not really wrong. Pretending they can do no wrong is not the same as not knowing what wrong is. Don't let that confuse you. These are two totally different things. Just because someone doesn't seem to believe they personally did anything wrong doesn't mean they don't know the difference between right and wrong at all. It means they don't believe they did anything wrong and that's all it means. A lot of people seem to be confused on that fact. Just because they don't think they did anything wrong doesn't mean they don't understand right and wrong. It means they believe they are entitled and justified to do those things. That's what it means. Mental illness can be very serious. It can be terrible and tragic, but it is not, not, not an excuse to abuse other people. Not when someone understands the difference between right and wrong. It's just not, and that's all there is to it. The only possible exception to this would be if someone is experiencing actual psychosis and literally cannot tell reality from fantasy. Narcissists live in denial and their perception is distorted, but they are not psychotic. They know what they're doing. They just don't care. Today I wanted to talk to you about how narcissism is a defense mechanism. We always hear about narcissistic personality disorder, but what about narcissism with a lowercase n? Narcissism is not a disorder. It's a trait, like a symptom. When someone has a pathological degree of narcissism, meaning an extreme, inflexible amount, then they may be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, or they may not. Someone can have an extreme and inflexible degree of narcissism, but not meet the specific criteria for NPD. Or they may, but it might not be recognized. This doesn't mean we can't call them a narcissist. NPD is not the only disorder or problem that has elements of narcissism. There are others, and they're not all personality disorders. Even still, contrary to popular belief, a person does not have to be diagnosed with NPD or any disorder to be considered a narcissist. And just because they're not doesn't mean they're not narcissistic. Narcissist is not a diagnosis and it doesn't need to be. It's a word we use to describe a type of person. So if narcissism is not a disorder, why is it so problematic? Narcissism evolves as a defense mechanism against abuse or neglect most of the time. Let's say there's a child whose parents ignore them most of the time. When the child does try to get attention, the child is spoken to harshly and pushed away. As the child grows up, they become a scapegoat for the parents. The child is blamed, abused, and neglected. The parent says and does horrible things to the child. You were a mistake. I wish you were never born. I hate you. You're worthless. You're stupid. You're ugly. To a child, this is like hearing these things from God. Small children who are not valued by their parents do not value themselves. It would be as if God himself came down from heaven and told you that you were worth nothing. The child's brain is immature and unable to defend against these words and these feelings. The only thing it can do is deny them and create a different reality for itself, so that's what it does. That's where the delusional beliefs narcissists hold come from, as well as the false self that they create. The false self is the narcissist's defense against these hurtful words and the resulting hateful feelings that they have for themselves. It's the wall they hide behind, the only real defense they have. It's their way of saying, look, I'm not bad, I'm good. I'm not worthless, I'm important. I'm not unwanted, I'm necessary. And most importantly, I'm not weak, I'm strong. 
This is why it's so important to the narcissist that other people believe in the false self. It's not for them, it's for the narcissist. How can something be untrue if other people believe it? The narcissist has no internal regulation system for their self-worth. Without input from others, it's zero. This is what so-called narcissistic supply is for. This is why they need it. Because of the abuse they suffered, they did not develop the way they were supposed to. Their mind was too preoccupied with simple survival, and as a result, their emotional capabilities are stuck in toddler survival mode. They've never matured or been able to move on. They never learned to deal with loss, control their emotions, handle frustration, or how to soothe themselves. To the narcissist, they're still in the abusive situation, still under attack all the time. And in a way, that's true. Their mind has never resolved the feelings of shame, self-hatred, and worthlessness from when they were really young. They still experience these feelings as if the abuse is going on right now. And the abuse they heard often still plays over and over again in their minds. But now instead of coming from outside, the abuse is coming from inside and has become a constant part of their inner dialogue. This is why they overreact to minor things or misperceive things as intentionally offensive or hurtful. They're not reacting to what's actually happening. They're reacting to that constant internal abuse and self-hatred. Narcissists believe they are defective, disgusting, unlovable, wretched, fundamentally loathsome, as I believe Marilyn Manson called it. That's probably the best phrase to describe the way they see themselves. Every time I try to explain this, I always feel that I'm not using strong enough adjectives, but that's probably pretty close. After all, if your own parents don't love you, you must be pretty despicable, right? This is how narcissists grow up. This is what they grow up believing. And as an aside, a lot of people say that the narcissists they know were not abused, that they were spoiled, and that they were coddled. Indulgence is abuse too. That's why it's called spoiling. When something is spoiled, it's ruined. Indulging, which we commonly call spoiling, ruins the child's potential as a person. When a child is coddled, when they're indulged, protected, given everything they want, a lot of the same things happen to them that happen to children abused in more recognized ways. The child's development does not proceed as it should. They never learn how to handle their emotions, self-soothe, deal with loss or disappointment. They don't know how to deal with frustration, and they learn to connect their worth to the actions of other people. It's the same mindset. If people don't give me what I want, that's because I'm not worth anything. Narcissism is not cruelty or being mean. Narcissism isn't not sharing things. Narcissism is self-centeredness that arises from the failure to distinguish the self from external objects. This means that the narcissist is unable to tell the difference between other people's feelings and their own or to regulate their own internal emotionality instead of relying on others to do it for them. It's the result of arrested development and indulgence and spoiling can cause it just as much as other forms of abuse. Now, there are some people that don't seem to have a history of abuse who still seem to be narcissists, and nobody knows why they are the way that they are. Some of them are probably lying, and they really were abused, but some of them really don't have a history of abuse, and nobody knows what causes that. They're doing research on that now, and maybe someday we'll have an answer. But for now, what we do know is that in the overwhelming majority of narcissistic people, there is a history of abuse. Imagine your self-worth truly relying on other people to the point that if they don't do what you want, you wouldn't feel that life was worth living. Imagine having to pretend you're someone else every second of every day and being so afraid that people would find out you are a disgusting thing that's not worthy of love, you would do anything to prevent that from happening. Imagine being unable to provide for your own even basic emotional needs and simply having to suffer until somebody else did it for you. Imagine being unable to see that this is the problem and instead believing that everyone in your life just tortures you and wants you to suffer because they're cruel and abusive and hate your guts. This is why they react the way they do when they don't get what they want. It doesn't matter why they didn't get it in reality. It is perceived as malicious and purposeful withholding which causes a narcissistic injury. You're not giving me what I want because you hate me and want me to suffer. Which, of course, really means I think I'm worthless and I'm afraid you think so too. I'm afraid you've figured out that I'm so defective that I don't deserve anything because that's what I believe about myself. Now, this is all subconscious and the narcissist may actually even be unaware of that on the surface. It's experienced by the narcissist as feelings of rage, loss, and rejection. Consciously, they just know they're not getting what they want because of you or because of whoever. A narcissistic injury 
for those that don't know, is something that's a threat or offense to their fragile self-worth. We could call it a blow to the ego, and it is, but because of the way narcissists are wired, this phrase really does not describe how severe of an injury this really is. Narcissists interpret it as life-threatening. This is why narcissistic injuries cause narcissistic rage. They literally feel that they are fighting in defense of their very lives. The sustaining of that false self is absolutely imperative to their survival. And narcissistic injuries threaten their perception of the false self. It's one of the reasons why they're so paranoid. If you were living a fake life, you'd be paranoid too. In a way, narcissism is the perfect defense mechanism. There is an excuse for everything, a reason why everything is somebody else's fault. They never have to listen to criticism. They never have to take responsibility. They never have to take the blame. They have justifications for every single thing they do wrong. With narcissistic projection, they can project their painful or uncomfortable emotions and thoughts about themselves onto other people, and then the narcissist doesn't even have to own those. Everything belongs to somebody else. However, because the narcissist is not truly able to separate themselves from the external world, it all still belongs to them. This is endlessly frustrating, like trying to throw a boomerang away. It just keeps coming back. It's sadly ironic that for all their complicated and convoluted machinations designed to defend themselves against all the abuse they believe they're experiencing, they aren't really escaping anything. They can't escape the abuse because even though they don't realize it, it's coming from inside them. They're only providing themselves temporary relief at best, and it comes at the expense of the very thing they need most, validation from other people. The more they blame, abuse, and hurt other people, the worse other people's opinions of them become. Eventually, these people leave, tired of the abuse and tired of the games. Then the narcissist is left alone with the very person they hate the most, themselves. Today I wanted to talk to you about the similarity between narcissists and ambush predators. This is an interesting metaphor, so I thought we could explore it on the show today. If you don't know, ambush predators capture or trap prey by stealth or by strategy. Now, this is typically not conscious, so in other words, it's not something that's planned and plotted and created, but something that is just simply how the predator operates. A crocodile doesn't plan to look like a floating log, nor does he realize that he looks like a floating log. He's just doing what crocodiles do. This is important to remember because for the majority of pathologically narcissistic people, it's the same. They're simply operating the way that they know how. They're doing what works and what has always worked for them to get their needs met. The use of the word predator sometimes carries a negative connotation for people, and some might believe that this word implies malicious intention to cause harm, but a lion doesn't maliciously intend to harm or torture a zebra. You know, they're not thinking of it that way. The zebra's well-being or feelings are not considered. The zebra's life and family are not taken into account. The zebra is assessed as far as how it can be used, and that's it. It's not understood or considered as an individual or even as a living thing, but merely as a food source. Some might argue that humans are capable of malicious intent, whereas animals are not, and perhaps this is so. However, in order to form malicious intent, the prey has to be considered as a separate individual capable of suffering, and the suffering has to register with and matter to the predator. With some high-functioning antisocial personalities, this is undoubtedly the case. But with your garden-variety, pathologically narcissistic person, it doesn't seem to be. They seem no more truly aware of the suffering of other humans than the lion is of the zebra's suffering, which is to say, not at all. What looks like purposeful, callous cruelty is often simply indifference, ignorance, and total self-absorption. Don't know, don't care, don't notice, because it's not about me. People may assume that the behavior is malicious because they can't conceive of the fact that someone doesn't understand these things or because they've told the person how hurt they are. And that makes complete sense, but it should be considered that just because someone is told something, even if they're told repeatedly, it doesn't mean they understand and it certainly doesn't mean they care. It's important to make sure then that you're not projecting your own qualities onto other people. Just because you would understand or care doesn't mean that somebody else is the same. Even if a pathologically narcissistic person is intellectually aware that someone is hurt or upset because they've been told or because they're seeing demonstrations of emotions, that doesn't mean there's any connection to anything inside them that causes this information to matter emotionally. Often there's not. 
This is also like the lion, who uses the zebra's expressed suffering only as evidence that it's not dead yet, and therefore she has to keep hanging on. And even after explaining all that, it's not even really the most important thing about this concept. Understanding that others are not considered as anything other than sources of fulfillment is what matters the most here. So why ambush predators? Well, rather than running food down with some kind of amazing speed or overtaking them by brute strength, as other predators might, ambush predators use camouflage, aggressive mimicry, or a trap. The use of aggressive mimicry in particular is applicable here. Aggressive mimicry is where a predator or a parasite mimics a harmless animal in order to mislead their prey or the host that they're feeding off of. This is the opposite of defensive mimicry, where prey animals mimic predators as a form of self-defense, such as when a butterfly's markings resemble the eyes of a predatory bird. If aggressive mimicry is comparable to a wolf in sheep's clothing, a defensive mimic is a sheep in wolf's clothing. Pathologically narcissistic people may employ either of these unconscious strategies at different times. In aggressive mimicry, signals, camouflage, lures, and other strategies are employed in order to create the illusion that the predator is harmless. The promise of sustenance or mating opportunities are often used. A predator using aggressive mimicry, for example, may disguise itself as a willing mate in order to lure prey close to it, or as a more harmless creature than it really is. Pathologically narcissistic people often use mimicry to appear as if they're something other than what they are in order to gain necessary relationships, necessary sustenance, sources of supply. Like all other things that use mimicry, they're doing this in order to survive. Without the validation given to them by others through attention, narcissists cannot sustain any self-worth. Human beings with no self-worth bottom out, and suicide becomes a very real threat. Narcissistic people are in constant danger of bottoming out, so securing a supply of validation is extremely important. This is not necessarily anything they're doing intentionally any more than any other living creature does. It's how they work. They have learned that the only way they can get their needs met is through mimicry and camouflage. They have adapted accordingly, and in most cases it's not a deliberate act any more than the crocodile is intending to look like a floating log. That doesn't mitigate the inherent danger here, and it absolutely does not excuse any abusive behavior, but understanding the mechanics of the motivation helps people understand what they're dealing with so that they can make informed choices. Narcissistic people understand the difference between right and wrong. They just don't think the behavior is wrong for them because, hey, they have to survive. If you had to steal food in order to eat, would it matter to you that stealing was wrong? Probably not all that much, right? Not if you were literally starving. This is the situation that the pathologically narcissistic person finds themselves in, and whatever maladaptive coping mechanisms or behaviors they have grown into are all considered justified under the umbrella of survival. If it's substance abuse, if it's lying, if it's cheating, if it's gaslighting, if it's raging, if it's violence, doesn't matter. Many are in denial that they're doing these things anyway, and if forced to acknowledge any of it, it will be dismissed as inconsequential when compared to the reason why they felt they had to do it in the first place. This is one of the most confusing things for people about narcissism. The behavior looks aggressive to others, but it feels defensive to the narcissist. This results in very, very different narratives about what has transpired in any situation. With the exception of some high-functioning antisocial personalities, virtually all of the behavior of pathologically narcissistic people is reactionary and defensive. The problem is that many times they're actually reacting to their own feelings and their own internal situation rather than anything other people have actually done. Because they're either unwilling or unable to confront that fact, the result is what looks like, and frankly what is, repeated, vicious, unprovoked attacks against other people. This often helps to create the perception that the narcissist is deliberately cruel just for cruelty's sake, and some probably are. However, it's important not to misunderstand what's actually going on here. It's one thing to believe that someone is being mean or cruel just because they want to be, and that that's the sole motivation. That's a really horrible situation, but the danger of that belief is that it's also something a person might believe could possibly be changed if circumstances, feelings, or situations were to change. We hear it all the time. If I could just prove to the narcissist, if I can just show them, if I can make them see, they're going to stop acting this way. However, when it's understood that someone is behaving the way that they are because they view others as sources of sustenance, and therefore they believe their very survival depends on it, that's a different situation. It changes the parameters of the discussion in a very important way.
There will always be those who believe that pathologically narcissistic people are intentionally plotting to hurt and scheme and destroy others for fun. Some of them undoubtedly are. But in the end, it doesn't even really matter. What matters is understanding that even at the very least, the best that can be hoped for is that the cruelty isn't really intentional because you just don't matter at all. Today I want to talk to you about how narcissists are like vampires. It might sound funny or a little melodramatic, but the comparison is more appropriate than you might think. After all, what are vampires? Yeah, sure, they're scary things in movies that drink blood and have supernatural strength, but what are they really? They are parasitic beings that need to feed off of a host in order to survive. When they have fed on the host to where it is depleted and can no longer support them, they move on. This is very similar to how a pathological narcissist operates. Vampires need blood in order to survive. The myths and theories about this are various, but many have to do with the fact that they are undead and therefore have no way of making or using their own blood. This is similar to why narcissists must feed off of other people as well. Pathologically narcissistic people live in a world of internal negativity. They have no way to create good feelings of their own. They have no way to validate themselves or build self-esteem. The only way they can counteract their feelings of self-hatred is to create a false self with characteristics they believe to be positive and absorb the positive feelings this false self elicits from people. People may admire, respect, or envy the false self of the narcissist, and though this satisfies the narcissist superficially, it's a poor substitute for real self-esteem and validation because the narcissist knows these things are not earned and that they're based on something that does not exist. Ironically, narcissists often insist that other people are fake in their admiration or support of them. This is because narcissists know that whatever admiration or positive regard they're given is actually for the false self not them, and therefore it's been tricked out of people rather than given honestly. This causes them to say that people are being fake. It's not a projection exactly, it's more that they're telling on themselves. They're saying, you don't really feel this way about me, but what they mean is, you can't feel this way about the real me because you don't know the real me. In other words, they think people's emotions are a manipulation because these emotions are based on something that's a manipulation in itself. People don't know that, of course, but the narcissist does. When people find out, they withdraw their support and admiration, and the narcissist's negativity has now been validated. They can then claim that they knew it all along, and that it's their trust which has been violated. And they probably really do feel hurt by this discovery and subsequent withdrawal of positive feelings. Narcissists feel deep shame and hatred for who and what they are, and the only way they can try to counteract that is by pretending they have qualities they don't really have in order to feel superficial admiration from others that they know is stolen. It's really a sad situation when you think about it. They also know that the positive qualities themselves that they are portraying are stolen. The false self is a fraud. It's the narcissist's fantasy of what they wish they were, and most of the qualities portrayed are things they admire in others that they have attempted to acquire, so to speak, but were unable to do so. So, like a kid playing dress-up, they fake it in order to receive the attention or recognition for these qualities that the people they envy receive. This is another way they're parasitic and like a vampire. Pathologically narcissistic people have little to no identity. They're like water or wax conforming to the shape of whatever container it's put into. They are mimics imitating the personalities they see and that they admire. Oftentimes this is someone they actually know, but it can also be a character in a book or a movie or a TV show, a famous person, a great thinker, a philosopher, or anybody else they wish they could be like. Unfortunately, they're usually a pretty pale imitation and they know it. Narcissists are pathologically envious, and they often latch onto people and things in an attempt to, quote, absorb things that they want. For example, if their partner is a great writer, they may read everything the partner writes and then start writing themselves. Their partner might misunderstand this as the narcissist taking an interest in them, but that is not what it is. It's an attempt to absorb some of the partner's talent, and more importantly, the recognition and special status that they believe comes with that talent. However, it's of course not possible to do that, and the narcissist inevitably becomes frustrated, especially because they have no patience to actually learn a skill or wait for results. 
In their frustration, they may accuse the other person of attempting to sabotage them, of believing they are better than the narcissist, and of being jealous because they secretly know the narcissist is better at writing than they are. In reality, it's the narcissist who feels that way, and very likely it's the narcissist who's trying to sabotage the partner in an attempt to take the real or imagined spotlight away from them. Having failed in their attempt to leech the person's talent away from them, the narcissist may begin to degrade their partner's ability or blatantly sabotage their partner's efforts. These are not people who can be happy for someone else. Everything is a competition, and all they can do is burn with envy that someone has something that they don't. Whatever it is, it becomes a constant reminder to the narcissist of their failure and worthlessness. If they cannot acquire it, they will attempt to ruin it so that nobody has it. They would rather see something destroyed than see it belong to somebody else. The parasitic nature of the pathological narcissist is evident in everything they do. You might notice that you are exhausted after dealing with narcissistic people. There's a reason for that. Narcissists are empty, and so they feed off of other people's energy, their emotions, their drive. They can't survive without doing that, and they need a constant stream of it. Truly like a vampire, it's a matter of life and death. Narcissists have no way to prop themselves up, no way to soothe themselves. Without other people to either feed them positive feelings or carry the load of their negative feelings by taking abuse so that the narcissist can vent their delusional self-hatred, the narcissist will not survive. Decompensation follows and then possibly even suicide. So they hang on, draining people of their energy and good qualities and their ability to care until there's nothing left. The person stops caring, stops reacting, stops feeding their energy to the narcissist. And with nothing left to take, the narcissist very often loses interest and just moves on. Luckily for you, that's not the end of the story. Without someone constantly depleting you, you can rebuild. Without someone sucking all your life force out every second, you can put it towards your goals, your dreams, and your talents. And remember, there's another thing narcissists have in common with vampires. They have to be invited in. I wanted to talk to you about the similarities between adult narcissists and children. This, of course, is not going to cover every single similarity, but I'm sure you can fill in plenty of the blanks for yourself. There are many similarities between the way adult narcissists think and process things and the way that children do. In fact, in many ways, these processes are virtually identical. This is because narcissists have arrested emotional development. The emotional maturity that most children go through did not occur within the narcissist for whatever reason. Often this reason is abuse or neglect during childhood. These things cause the child to focus intensely on themselves to the exclusion of all other things because their needs are not being met and their emotions are not being validated. This also results in the mind being taken up with trying to defend itself from the abuse. The mind is, in a sense, always playing catch-up, and because of the trauma that it is experiencing, some important developments are skipped, so to speak, or don't happen. The mind becomes locked in a pattern of defensive reaction and emotional perception made up of many different but related facets that matures extremely slowly and is extraordinarily resistant to change. We call this reaction defense pattern malignant narcissism. In children, these things are normal. In adults, they are evidence of disorder. Young children and babies are not capable of understanding the emotions or needs of others. They only know want and need. They have no way of taking care of their own needs, and they can only scream for someone else to do it for them. When the mother is exhausted and deathly ill with a fever and vomiting and she's been up for three days and she simply cannot cope anymore, does the baby sympathize with this? Does the baby stop crying? No. The baby does not recognize this. The baby does not care because the baby cannot care. They can only keep screaming out their needs regardless of the mother's suffering. This is, in essence, what you are dealing with when it comes to narcissists. For the most part... Narcissists do not recognize, understand, or consider other people's needs. They see only their own and their inability to meet them. The more damaged the narcissist is, the more narcissistic they will be, the more immature they will be, and the more childish their way of thinking. And this is not childish as in silly, this is immature and childish as in the emotional maturity and understanding of a toddler. For example, 
Besides the hysterical tantrum behavior we see in many narcissists that is very clearly on par with a young child, narcissists often believe they are immune to the things that happen to, quote, regular people. This is an example of something called magical thinking, which is a phenomenon we commonly see in very young children. A child that makes a wish for a pony may believe that they're going to get a pony. That is what magical thinking is. Narcissists see feelings as facts the way that children do. Narcissists see everything in the world as an extension of themselves the way that children do. And narcissists believe in their own perceived omnipresence and immortality as children do. They have always been, they will always be. So children believe and so narcissists believe. The view that they are just another person that must fit into a wider world does not occur to young children. How could it? Rather, they function under the assumption that the world fits around them and that everything they experience or encounter is related to them in some way. This is the same way narcissists see things. They have never matured past this extremely immature way of looking at things. The idea that the world does not revolve around them never occurs to children as it does not occur to narcissists. This is why they tell you to make sure you talk with your child so that the child does not think that divorce is their fault because children perceive everything in their world as related to them as flowing to them as flowing from them. For example, children view their parents as only having to do with them and connected only to them rather than as separate people with their own lives, needs, wants, feelings. Parents are very one-dimensional to young children. Despite the fact that children are only one part of the parent's life, the child does not see this or understand that in any way. To a child, parents only exist as their caretakers. It's the only context that children view parents in, and it's the only context they can understand. This is identical to how narcissists view other people. Outside of the narcissist and the narcissist's needs, people don't exist. As children mature, they learn that this viewpoint is not true. They learn to see and appreciate their parents as individuals that are separate from themselves. The development of the narcissist is so arrested that this, coupled with such extreme self-focus, means they are never able to separate themselves as authentic individuals from other people and from the external world in general. Because of this, they often feel acted upon by the world and other people or circumstances rather than as people who act in the world. In their view, they do not act, but rather react to things that are being done to them. It's as if they never outgrew the idea of themselves as powerless children, unable to take control or ownership of their own lives. They behave as though other people are still responsible for them and their emotions the way that parents are responsible for a small child. They seem unable to own their own choices or even to recognize that things are choices. And this is also like a child. Narcissists are generally impulsive, irrational, and extremely immature. They are careless, irresponsible, and foolhardy. They don't seem able to consider consequences or think about things before they do them, just like children. When pressed for an answer as to why they've done something, narcissists may seem just as mystified as everybody else. I don't know is a very common answer, and it may be the truth. Narcissists seem to possess very little insight as to why they do things, simply reacting on impulse as we see children do. Like children, narcissists often feel helpless in a world of more powerful, more competent, more knowledgeable adults. That's why they create a false self that is the diametric opposite of that. They want to appear like everybody else. They want to appear powerful, competent, knowledgeable. Whatever they are attempting to appear to be, you can be sure that the reality is the opposite of that. However, this helplessness is also an excuse. It's easier to be a helpless victim. If you're a victim, you can never be blamed. If you're helpless, you can never be forced to take responsibility. Children are not blamed for not controlling themselves or for their choices. Narcissists don't seem to feel they should be either. They don't seem to understand the difference between a child and an adult, and they will actually often say things to that effect. These are mostly things that no mature, self-respecting adult would ever say. They may compare themselves to the children, compete with the children, or complain that their spouse holds double standards because the kids are allowed to get away with things that they're called out for. They don't seem to realize that adults and children are held to different standards or why that should be. For example, the narcissist must be asked repeatedly every single night to bring their plate into the kitchen or throw their clothing in the hamper rather than leaving these things on the ground. Instead of simply doing it, the narcissist responds that little Johnny never does it either, but he doesn't get yelled at. Little Johnny is seven. The narcissist is 40 and is one of little Johnny's parents. The discrepancy here is obvious. This is the type of response you would receive from a child that does not want to do their chores, not an adult. 
an adult shouldn't even need to be told. To the narcissist, however, this is a clear example of favoritism and being attacked solely for who they are. Little Johnny is getting away with the same thing. It does not seem to enter their mind that there is a very large difference between a 7-year-old and a 40-year-old. Regardless of whether or not they actually feel that way, the childishness and absurdity of this argument is really unbelievable. It's almost shocking in its ignorance. There is not only the complete refusal to behave as an adult, there is an inability to even understand why this would be expected. The truth is, underneath all the horrible things they do, underneath all of the expectations of special treatment and everything else, the narcissist is still that five-year-old child pretending they're somebody else to escape an abusive situation that ended years ago. When all their reasoning is examined, when all their behavior is scrutinized and looked at through the lens of perspective rather than pain, this is what we're left with. A person with the emotional maturity of a toddler who cannot understand why they're expected to behave otherwise and who is trying desperately to pretend that they're somebody else. All of their attention seeking, all of their manipulations, all the gaslighting smear campaigns, all of their abuse, all of the hurtful things they do. When seen for what these things really are, they're nothing but childish behaviors that have been perpetrated by an adult. Every single one of these things is seen in children. Gaslighting is a three-year-old with chocolate all over his face who is hiding the chocolate bar behind his back in plain sight, saying, What chocolate, Mommy? I don't have chocolate. I wasn't eating chocolate. Smear campaigns are a six-year-old telling lies about a girl to that girl's friends so they won't like her anymore. They can all be compared to the behaviors of children. Though these behaviors are sometimes seen as sophisticated schemes, they really aren't. They are the same childish and petty things we all dealt with on the elementary school playground. They're just more confusing and therefore more dangerous because they're coming from an adult. Today I wanted to talk to you about something very important regarding pathologically narcissistic people and that is that for all intents and purposes, narcissists are emotionally disabled. In fact, some even receive social security disability because they're unable to work due to the problems they have regarding their personality disorders. The definition of disabled is having a physical or mental condition that limits movement, sense, or activities. This absolutely applies to pathologically narcissistic people. While their intellectual and physical capabilities are usually not impacted, their emotional abilities are seriously affected. These are people who have the emotional capabilities and understanding of a toddler or maybe an even younger child. They are either totally possessed by their emotions or so divorced from them that they seem to have none at all. Underneath, Emotion controls everything pathologically narcissistic people do, but because they have such limited understanding of and sometimes attachment to their emotions, they may not even be aware of this at all. You will often find that, along with the usual emotional dysregulation we see with narcissistic people, they also cannot articulate their emotions to others and they have very little to no understanding of how other people are feeling at all. This is also very like a young child. Pathologically narcissistic people have arrested emotional development. If you met an adult who had the physical capabilities of a toddler, you would be able to understand that right away. If you met an adult with the intellectual capabilities of a toddler, you would recognize that right away as well. But when someone has the physical appearance and the intellectual capabilities of a grown person, it can be very hard to understand or even see the amount of emotional difficulty that they're having. You may not see it at all until this person becomes upset. This is especially true because they have evolved within their dysfunction to compensate for it in some ways. They've had to in order to survive. Imagine a two-year-old just left on the street to fend for themselves. They would either die or they would learn. Narcissists have learned. They've learned to mimic. They've learned to manipulate. They've learned to try to compensate intellectually for the emotional difficulties that they're having and to rationalize the decisions they're making based on this dysfunctional process. In other words, instead of growing out of their dysfunction, they have grown into it. It can help to look at pathologically narcissistic people as disabled because the frank truth of it is they are. If someone is pathologically narcissistic, they are usually affected pretty severely by narcissism in most areas of their life. 
They will often have a lot of trouble with jobs, with authority figures, with relationships of any kind, and just generally with life. We often find that the way they perceive things is not how they really are, and that in general, their mindset and way of thinking is simply not conducive with social situations or with the way that life actually works. There are some pathologically narcissistic people who are able to function well in some areas of their life, but we will usually see problems because of narcissism in at least one major area of their lives, and these problems are usually pretty severe. For example, a narcissist may do very well at their job, but have extremely serious problems with interpersonal relationships. They often have problems with addiction and impulse control as well. One thing it's important to remember, though, is that pathologically narcissistic people know right from wrong. They understand that the things they're doing would be considered wrong, at least by other people, if not themselves, and that's one reason they attempt to hide these things. They're able to control their behavior as well. Some people have trouble believing that, but ask yourself if the behavior has ever occurred in a place where the narcissist knew they could not get away with that. The answer is almost always no. We should, therefore, not consider pathologically narcissistic people disabled and unable to help their behavior. How we should consider them is disabled and unwilling to make any of the changes in their lives that are necessary to deal with their disability. If someone has lost the use of their legs, they learn to use a wheelchair. They make whatever renovations to their home and modifications to their vehicle that are necessary in order to accommodate their disability. They don't insist that somebody else carry them everywhere for the rest of their lives. If someone has lost their sight, they learn to memorize the layout of their house. They learn to count their steps so they know how to get where they're going and back. They learn to use their other senses to help guide them. They don't insist that someone else do everything for them. This is what pathologically narcissistic people are doing. They are making their disability everyone else's problem, while at the same time insisting they don't even have one. They insist everyone make all these allowances and special rules for them and their unacknowledged disability, while at the same time claiming they're not the ones with the problem. Even though pathologically narcissistic people are emotionally disabled in pretty much every way it's possible to be, there are things they could do to make living with that and navigating their lives easier. Their problems are not going to go away, but they can often be managed differently. The right medication can help. Learning new skills to help with emotional reactivity, such as reality testing and creating new coping mechanisms can help. Learning to sit with and process emotions can help. There are many things they could do to take a proactive approach to dealing with this problem. Even small things such as cutting down on sugar and caffeine intake or eating better food and getting more sleep. It won't cure their narcissism, but it can help with managing their behavior. However, most of them refuse to even acknowledge that there's a problem at all in any real way, so nothing ever changes. And make no mistake, it is a refusal. Because inside of themselves, they generally know that something is wrong. They may even admit this or make allusions to it. Facing this head-on is not impossible for them, but it can be extremely unpleasant and frightening, so they simply refuse to do it. They continue to go through life without the ability to walk, insisting that others need to carry them. There's no way to help a person who does not want to help themselves, and excusing their behavior or rescuing them only makes the problem worse. If narcissistic people refuse to do the things they could do in order to manage a problem, there's nothing anyone else can do. It is not up to everyone else in this person's life to make changes and accommodations and allowances for them when they won't even do the bare minimum for themselves. All you can do is make sure you understand the situation so that you can be sure you are not making things worse on yourself. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something that is very common in relationships of any kind with pathologically narcissistic people, and that is the fact that they don't listen. And sometimes they can even seem to be incapable of hearing you. You might notice that when you speak to a pathologically narcissistic person, though they seem to be listening and they're often even looking right at you, they then respond with something that has nothing to do with what you just said or they only seem to hear one part of what you said and somehow manage to come to the exact wrong or opposite conclusion of your words. This is often a huge problem in these kind of relationships and it is especially bad when the narcissistic person is upset. 
How upset they are often dictates how much they're able to listen, and if they're too upset, it may be totally useless to even bother talking to this person because they just cannot hear you. Many people think this is deliberate, and for some pathologically narcissistic people, it's probably true. But it also happens because their feelings are so overwhelming to them that that wave of emotion simply blocks everything else out. It can seem like they're changing the subject with their responses to you, or that they're ignoring you, and maybe they are. But often it seems that they're not even hearing you. After dealing with this for a while, you may even be able to recognize the look in their eyes when they're no longer listening to you. They seem to be listening to somebody else talking that only they can hear, and in a way they are. They're listening to the raving, screeching voice of their own feelings. For a pathologically narcissistic person, feelings are facts. Instead of being able to view their feelings objectively as temporary reactions that may or may not be logical, their feelings are interpreted as factual. In practical terms, this means they fit the facts to their feelings rather than reacting emotionally to the facts. To put that into perspective, most people don't get upset until something happens or is done to them. Narcissists are already upset, and because of that, they become convinced that something must have been done to them to cause those feelings. This happens partly because narcissistic people are so divorced and separated from their feelings through years of denying and avoiding them that they can experience their feelings as coming from somewhere outside themselves. This is why they'll say things like, I know you hate me, I can feel it. And you're sitting there like, okay, well, you're not getting that from me because I don't hate you. That's their self-loathing, their own self-hatred that they feel. In other words, in these situations, they don't recognize that these feelings were already there and they're not even related to the situation at hand. They become triggered and offended or hurt so easily that the feelings they already feel break through at the slightest provocation and then they blame the other person for causing them to feel the way they already felt but have been denying. For example, if you say, why didn't you wash the dishes? The shame that the narcissistic person already feels breaks through their denial. This can cause them to lash out at you angrily in self-defense, accusing you of trying to hurt them, to make them feel bad, of demeaning or degrading them, or any number of other things, not because of what actually happened or what was actually said, but because of that shame that they're constantly carrying around. This can be very hurtful and stressful to a partner or a family member who in no way meant anything like that and certainly was not trying to be mean. And now there's no reasoning with the narcissist because they are far too upset. They will not listen to anything other than what their feelings are telling them. Proof doesn't matter. Logic doesn't matter. Nothing matters except for their feelings. It's like dealing with a little kid. In some ways, although I certainly understand why people feel this way, it's almost weird for me to hear narcissists described as these apex predators. These are some seriously fragile people. They can't live in reality. They can't face the truth. They live every single day playing pretend like a child. They feel hurt and offended and attacked by almost everything anybody says or does, sometimes even things that are complimentary or kind. And why? Because their feelings dictate their reality instead of the other way around, and they seem to have no way to recognize that this is a problem. Most people operate like, you said something mean, therefore I'm upset and angry. Narcissists operate like, I'm upset and angry, therefore you said something mean. It's backwards. Events, actions, and things that are said are interpreted through the lens of the narcissist's feelings. Because of this, events, actions, and motives will often be reframed to fit the narcissist's emotional narrative. Seen through the lens of this emotion, things that happen or that other people do and say often become much more sinister, suspicious, and personal to the narcissist than they actually are. This is one reason why people are often accused of having motives they don't have or of saying and doing things that they did not say or do. This is also one of the big reasons it's impossible to reason with pathologically narcissistic people, especially when they're upset. They can't even really hear what you're trying to say, and even if they could, they're certainly not going to trust you over their own feelings, which override literally everything. Sometimes they can't even get what they are trying to say to come out right. Narcissistic people have immense difficulty communicating with any authenticity because everything coming in and going out has to go through that emotional filter. More than that, since their feelings are interpreted as factual, those feelings are considered evidence. This must be true because I feel it. The proof that you were intentionally trying to hurt me is that I feel hurt. The proof that you are tricking me is that I feel tricked. The proof that you are cheating is that I feel like I've been cheated on and so on and so on and so on. 
There's no way to communicate in this situation because the premise of the conversation and the issue are illogical. It's you trying to talk this person out of their feelings, feelings they often had no logical basis for in the first place. Not only is that not possible, but it can make the narcissist feel as if you're trying to manipulate them. Narcissistic people have huge issues with trust. They don't even trust themselves. So they're generally in a constant battle between trying to determine what is safe and what is not safe. One moment they trust you more than themselves, so you're a safe place. The next moment they trust themselves more than you, so now you are not a safe place. In situations such as our example about the dishes, if they were to believe you over their own feelings, that makes them vulnerable to you and whatever evil things that you're probably going to do to them at some point, possibly, maybe, they're for sure. That can't be allowed to happen, and it won't be allowed to happen. Even tangible, physical proof does not matter to them in these situations. They are so worried about being tricked and about not being wrong that they can appear almost delusional. So you say, yes, but here's a video of what actually happened. Oh, you edited that to make me look bad or to make yourself look better. Yes, but here's a picture of you doing this thing that you said you didn't do. You faked that to make me look like a liar. Yes, but here's a message in your own words. You wrote that and sent it to yourself to frame me. There's no reasoning with this. It's illogical and it's ridiculous. The overwhelming emotions coupled with their fear of being vulnerable and taken advantage of, along with their pathological need to be right, or more precisely, not to be wrong, make communication with this kind of person impossible. You are not on a level playing field at all. Whether they realize how absurd their arguments can be is a difficult question. Some probably do, but they might feel they've gone too far with it to simply just give in, no matter how stupid it sounds. Others may be in the grip of whatever emotion they're feeling and just running off at the mouth without even really realizing what they're even saying. Some may believe that they're smarter than the person they're arguing with and can somehow make these ludicrous arguments work, while others may be making these nonsensical arguments because that's literally the only thing they have left to say. It doesn't really matter whether they know they're doing it or not or why they're doing it or anything else. It isn't possible to communicate with someone who cannot or will not listen to you, and it doesn't really matter why. The naked truth is that even if you could make them hear you, they still wouldn't care. I wanted to talk to you about something that I don't think gets enough attention, and that is whether narcissists are dangerous. Now, of course, this is a general question, and therefore the answer will be general as well. It is impossible to predict the behavior of human beings with any accuracy at all, so just remember that every situation is a little bit different. So let's jump right in. Are narcissists dangerous? In a word, yes, they are. Narcissists tend to view people as either stepping stones on the path to what they want or as stumbling blocks in the way of it. As objects, in other words, someone with this way of looking at things is very dangerous. One of the biggest things that keeps us from hurting or killing other people is empathy. We are able to understand emotionally how other people feel, and because of that, we don't want to hurt them. Narcissists generally don't have that ability. If they do, it is a dysfunctional and maladaptive type of empathy that is just not strong enough to override their impulses and feelings. A non-personality disordered person's inner dialogue might go something like this. Oh, I really like this necklace my friend left lying out. I wish I could have it. The desire for the necklace might lead to the impulse to take the necklace because we're all primitive beings underneath, but morality and empathy keeps you from doing it. You might say to yourself, oh, if I took it, my friend would be hurt because she trusts me, or it's wrong to steal. This inner dialogue does not occur in a personality disordered person. They simply see the necklace, want the necklace, and if the opportunity exists, they will take the necklace. There is no consideration of morality because the narcissist dictates their own morality as whatever they want to do is okay to do. If someone stole from the narcissist, the narcissist would be very, very angry, but they don't experience these conflicts when it's their own behavior. There is no conflict. It's I see, I want, I take. 
the subject of their friend's hurt feelings or broken trust also generally would not come up. If it does, it's dismissed or rationalized away because it's just not as important as the narcissist wanting the necklace. This rationalization would be accomplished by arguments like, oh, she'll never know, or she doesn't need it anyway. The only conflict that exists within the narcissist in this kind of situation is not morality or empathy, but fear. They don't fear hurting their friend or the guilt of stealing. They fear being caught, being shamed. They fear being seen as a bad person. Nobody likes a thief, and the narcissist knows that. Now, they have no problem with being a thief. They have a problem with people knowing they're a thief. They don't want to get caught. There are times when the narcissist will appear to exercise morality in these kinds of situations, but this is actually generally because they have their eyes on another bigger goal. Like, if I take the necklace and she finds out, she won't take me on that trip to Mexico with her and I really want to go. As you can see, it isn't morality that has won here, but a bigger desire. So the conflict or the rationalization is solved by thinking along the lines of, if I satisfy my desire for this thing, the necklace, my desire for the other thing, the trip to Mexico, will not be fulfilled and I want that thing more. The thought process of the narcissist is not, is it okay to do this, but rather, can I succeed or can I get away with doing this? If the answer is yes, most of the time they'll do it. If they think they can get away with it, they will do it. This is why they're dangerous, because they're not guided by a set of internal rules and standards, but by whatever external monitors there happen to be. If there are no external monitors, they'll do whatever they want. It has been said that integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Going by that, then we would say, narcissists have no integrity. Alone with a narcissist who feels that no one will know or see what they're doing, it's a very dangerous place to be. They have no empathy, no morals, no integrity, and no impulse control. A narcissist who has never been physically abusive is a narcissist who has either never felt they could get away with it or who has never felt the need to be physically abusive. It's not because they have some moral objection to hurting other people because they don't. If they felt they could get away with it and it was necessary, they would do it. It's the same with murder. A narcissist who has never killed anybody is a narcissist who has either never felt they could get away with it or who's never felt they needed to kill anyone. Prisons are full of narcissists. These are the people who feel they have the right to take things that don't belong to them, the right to assault others, the right to rape others, the right to kill others. They feel entitled to any and everything they want just because they want it. This is partially because the dynamic of want and need is very confused in the mind of a narcissist. Everything they want, they think they need. And if they need it, that means they're entitled to it. If you need something, then you're entitled to it. You're entitled to food. You're entitled to air. They believe they're entitled to everything they want because they don't believe they want it. They feel they need it. This means if you get in their way, you are denying them fulfillment of their needs. This is not an enviable place to be in, and it doesn't just involve material things. For example, love triangles. In a love triangle, there are three people. One person is the desired object, and the other two people are competing to win this desired object. Now, this is a volatile emotional situation no matter who's involved. When narcissists are involved, it can turn into a deadly situation very quickly. Narcissists don't like competitions. They seek to control every situation because they feel that they are perpetual losers and they can't take not just the shame of being the loser here but the rejection that this entails as well they prefer to simply eliminate the competition and win by default if this requires murder then it requires murder they have no moral quandaries over these kinds of things they only have practical quandaries 
This resolves itself in the mind of the narcissist by thinking things like, if he's gone, she'll have no other choice but to be with me. The rage factor of narcissism is largely at play here also, which is what makes them murderous in the first place. The person in the middle of the love triangle belongs to the narcissist. This is how the narcissist feels and how dare someone else think they can take something that belongs to the narcissist. The desired object is not seen as a person with their own feelings, wants, and identity, but as an actual object that can be stolen, as an actual object to be won. Someone trying to take something that belongs to the narcissist is in very grave danger. These people do not suffer loss well at all. This is why so many narcissists are domestic abusers and murderers. I have a theory that most, if not all, domestic abusers are narcissists, specifically borderline personalities, because of the rage, the desperation, the delusional thinking, and the inability to deal with rejection, as well as the fact that it's often only their romantic and personal relationships where they actually have problems. Borderline personality disordered narcissists often feel that without a partner to validate their existence, they don't exist at all. Losing their partner means losing themselves in a very real way. It's a threat to their very existence. Because they fear rejection and abandonment so much, they perceive it in everything, even when it's not really there. They then react to this perceived rejection and abandonment with rage, hysteria, and violence in order to punish their partner and force their partner to do what the narcissist wants them to do. This, in turn, causes the partner to reject the narcissist for real, which leads to more abuse. The domestic abuser narcissist is essentially saying, what you want doesn't matter, what you need doesn't matter. Nothing about you matters. Only what I want matters, and what I want is for you to stay with me because I cannot face the shame of failure and the rejection of you leaving. You exist only to fulfill that need, only to stop the anxiety and the turmoil that I will feel if that happens. If you don't give me what I want, what I need, I will hurt you. If that doesn't work, I will kill you. This is an example of the power and control narcissists believe they have over other people. That belief is absolutely essential to their lives. Everything is constructed around that belief. When this belief is threatened, such as by a partner leaving or attempting to end the relationship, they perceive that as life-threatening. This is why they feel murder is a justifiable response. When the loss of a partner equals the loss of the self or the identity, this is then interpreted into a nothing-left-to-lose situation. If you add in the revenge and punishment factor that is a core element of all narcissism, you have a situation that has become extremely dangerous. Narcissists who have killed their partners are even known to react with surprise that people don't think it was okay for them to do that. They can't understand why they're in trouble when, in their opinion, they only did what anybody else would do in the same situation. What would you do if your life was threatened? You would take out the threat. They believe this is a life-threatening situation and they will respond in extremity. So to answer the question, yes, narcissists are dangerous. Who else but a narcissist thinks that what they want is more important than someone's life? I wanted to talk to you about something that is very important to understand when dealing with narcissistic people, and that is that if you're going to continue to deal with them on any level, you must accept that this is the way they are. Many people wonder how narcissists can seem to be okay one minute and crazy, violent, hysterical, or totally cold the next minute. The thing is, this is a misunderstanding of how the personality works. People sometimes say things like, I just want them to act normally but they are acting normally. This is their normal. They've never been any other way. And if you choose to deal with pathologically narcissistic people on any level, you have to accept that this is the way that they are. 
the good aspects of their personality cannot and do not exist without the rest of it. It's a package deal. Now, it's always best not to deal with narcissistic people when they have been identified, but for many reasons, people can and often do choose to continue all types of relationships with narcissists, family, friends, romantic. Managing the relationship and the amount of stress it causes is crucial in this situation. So much of the stress caused by dealing with pathologically narcissistic people is rooted in the idea that one day the bad side of their personality will be mitigated and even disappear or that the good side can be reached and somehow brought out all the time. This is not a realistic expectation. These aspects all exist together. They're not independent of each other. They're parts of this same whole. You cannot have one without the others. If someone is going to have any kind of relationship with a narcissist, they need to understand and accept that this is how it is. Otherwise, the stress will cause enormous damage to your life. It's important to realize that even if you want them to change these things, and even if at times they really want to change them too, the odds are very long that they're going to be able to do that. Pathologically narcissistic people are often dealing with arrested emotional development, among other problems. It may be that they are unable to change these things, and even if they are able to do so, it can be very hard and very painful. Many people are just not up to something like that, whether they're a narcissist or not. A pathologically narcissistic person with limited emotional resources or understanding and zero coping mechanisms beyond the maladaptive ones they've been using their whole lives may simply be unable to even try. And even if they could at least try, they probably don't want to. They know only their ways to get their needs met and the idea of giving these up is like trying to learn to breathe through your ears. The goal of the pathologically narcissistic person is protection of the self, not healing. Because as humans, we must hurt in order to heal, this goes against their prime directive. The fact that such obsessive protection would no longer be necessary if they could in fact heal is information without meaning. A life where such aggressive protection of the self is not necessary is probably unimaginable for narcissists. And if it were imaginable, it would likely be seen as similar to having to swim through shark infested waters to freedom with meat tied around your neck and 25 pound weights attached to your feet. In other words, too dangerous to attempt. Many just can't do it. Even if they can succeed at changing some of their behaviors, the mindset and the motivations behind these behaviors is not different. Often they simply change one manipulative or abusive behavior for another. For example, a person who was physically violent may stop being physically abusive, but start betraying the relationship in other ways. A person who created financial catastrophes may stop overspending, but create emotional crises and those type of catastrophes instead. The part of their personality that drives this behavior is not going to go away, and that's why it's part of their personality. It exists alongside the quote-unquote good parts of their personality and is inextricably entwined with them. It cannot be separated. So if you're going to deal with this person, it's important to understand that these things are not separate. They're the same. The good person you love and the bad person you hate or fear are the same person. Both of these sides and every other one they show are equally genuine for whatever that actually means. They really are that amazing sometimes, and they really are that terrible sometimes. They also aren't either of these things. They are both, and they are neither. It seems impossible, and in a balanced, integrated person, it usually is. But the pathologically narcissistic person has a fractured or split personality. It's similar to the phenomenon of multiple personalities, although in a narcissist, these pieces are not fully formed personalities at all, but rather parts of a larger whole. These different parts are not integrated or cohesive. They exist apart from each other rather than in balance, and in some narcissists, they are totally denied. It's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation, except that the narcissist is not usually unaware of the existence of this quote-unquote bad side because it's not separate. They know it's there. They're in denial of it. This, of course, causes it to get stronger and stronger until the entire focus of their existence has become about denying it. Healing would require the acknowledgement of these things, facing things they've spent their entire lives running from. It's just unlikely that that's ever going to happen, and even if it did, it still might not end up helping anything. 
Narcissists that are forced to face these things with no coping mechanisms or other protections can end up being suicidal. If you choose to deal with narcissistic people on any level, it's important to understand that you have to accept the bad with the good. You don't have to approve of it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to condone it, but you have to accept it. These things are inseparable and you cannot have one without the other because they're both part of the same person. This is their normal and whether it's because they can't or they won't, it's not likely to change. It's necessary to adjust expectations in order to manage the relationship and the amount of stress it causes you. It's not possible to control the behavior of other people and you cannot love the pathology out of somebody. So if you want a narcissistic person in your life, you're going to have to take the good with the bad because they can't be separated. People often feel as if they're dealing with two different people or more when dealing with a pathologically narcissistic person, but they're not. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are not different people. The reality is that Dr. Jekyll is Mr. Hyde, and that's just how it is. Today, I wanted to talk to you about what narcissists are hiding. This is something a lot of people wonder about, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. Some of these things seem to actually contradict the narcissistic person's actions or their persona, but that's exactly the point. If you find these things hard to believe, it's just a testament to how good the narcissist act really can be. The first thing most narcissists are hiding is that they are having a lot of emotional trouble. People who are pathologically narcissistic generally have a lot of trouble with emotions, their own and the emotions of other people. They have trouble reading and recognizing them. They have trouble understanding them. They have trouble naming or defining them. They just have general trouble in this area. Many narcissistic people struggle with emotional regulation and they find their emotions scary or overwhelming. Others are so disconnected from them that they may be unaware they're even feeling them or what they mean. Many of the coping mechanisms we see in pathologically narcissistic people can be the result of these emotional troubles, such as projection, gaslighting, idealization, devaluing, or discarding others, and more. For example, at the core of the pathologically narcissistic personality is deep-seated shame, and this drives an enormous amount of their behavior, often completely unbeknownst to them. This shame wears many masks, and it can look like many things, including rage, jealousy, envy, paranoia, self-aggrandizement, egotism, and more. When dealing with people who are truly narcissistic, it's important to remember that even though this person might be intelligent, well-spoken, and chronologically a grown-up, you are likely dealing with someone who is using a maladapted, dysfunctional adult version of the emotional coping and regulation skills of a toddler or an even younger child. This doesn't excuse their behavior in any way, but it can make it a little easier to understand. Another thing they're hiding is that they are not who they pretend to be, ever. At first glance, narcissistic people often present themselves as very different from who they really believe themselves to be. It's not a great act, nor is it capable of withstanding very much scrutiny at all, but it can be very misleading if someone is not looking closely or if they don't know what they're looking at. It's often said that narcissistic people tell on themselves, and this is true. But if you don't know what to look for, you might miss it. For example, the narcissist that is striving to come across as confident and self-assured can be very convincing. But if you pay attention, you'll notice there are holes in the performance. Because they're only pretending to be what they think is acceptable or admirable, they don't always get it right. They may be a little too braggadocious, a little too assertive, a little too self-assured. This overacting is very common, regardless of what image they're trying to project. That's because this projected image is an overcompensation for the self-hatred, weakness, insecurity, helplessness, or whatever else that they feel that they're trying to hide. It's not genuine, so the helpless victim is a little too helpless or has a few too many hard luck stories. The happy-go-lucky person is a little too happy-go-lucky. The tough guy is a little too tough. The sensitive lover is a little too solicitous. These may, in fact, be actual facets of their personality, but they often seem overblown and superficial because they're being used as a diversion from other things, and in their own way, they are as over-the-top as all of the other facets of the narcissist's personality. 
Remember that people who truly have a quality don't have to try so hard to prove it to everybody else and make note of behavior that contradicts the image you're being presented. Someone who is happy and confident doesn't need to hurt other people when they get upset. They aren't jealous or envious. Someone who is in control and self-assured doesn't need to control other people. They don't need to play power games. In general, people who really are whatever narcissists are just pretending to be don't behave the way that narcissists behave. Another thing they're hiding is that they don't like themselves very much. Contrary to popular belief, narcissists are not overflowing with self-esteem. They are chronically self-focused and they are self-important, but that's not the same thing. When it comes to how they truly feel about themselves, narcissists are generally at the extreme low end of the spectrum. Pathological toxic narcissism is not the result of having too much self-esteem or self-worth. It's the result of having virtually none at all and no ability to create any. Pathologically narcissistic people are like very young children in this way. They rely on others to reflect who they are back to them because they lack the ability to form a true and stable self-concept on their own. The inability to do this is a pretty serious handicap for a human being and it requires narcissists to use other people's reactions to them as a way to create some approximation of self-worth. This primitive survival mechanism is called mirroring and it's the main function of other people in a narcissist's life. Regardless of the relationship, doesn't matter, this is the main purpose of that relationship. Not only do pathologically narcissistic people have no self-worth to speak of, they're often consumed with self-hatred and shame surrounding who they are. This is what is behind all of their paranoia, jealousy, envy, rage, devaluation, discarding all of their false selves, and more. If you love yourself, if you truly love and accept yourself, you don't need to create a false self to show other people because you know that who you are is good enough. Once again, make note of behavior that contradicts the image you're being presented with. It can be hard to believe this sometimes, depending on the individual you might be dealing with, but that just shows how good this act really can be. Many of them are extremely adept at hiding this. They've had to be. This is how they've survived. And some are so disconnected from their inner landscape and from their feelings that they sincerely might not even realize this is the case. However, if we pay attention to the narcissist, to their behavior, to the things they say, and we understand what we're actually looking at, if we learn to see the misdirection and the misleading for what these things really are, it becomes impossible to miss. It's like pulling the curtain back on the little man behind the big head in the Wizard of Oz. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it and the illusion does not work anymore. Another thing they're trying to hide is that they're afraid. When we observe the behavior of pathologically narcissistic people, we start to see something that they would probably rather we did not see, and that's fear. It can be hard to see at first sometimes, depending on how they react to things, but to the astute observer, it becomes very obvious after a while. Fear is one of the narcissistic person's biggest motivations, even if they don't realize that. Many people believe that one of their biggest motivations is power and control, and that's true on the surface, but what is behind the desire for power and control? What makes someone feel that they need this so badly? The answer is fear. Fear of being powerless, fear of being out of control, fear of not being able to meet their own needs, fear for their own survival. They also fear the huge amounts of deep-seated pathological shame that they are usually carrying around. This is often mistaken for remorse by the narcissist and the people around them, but it isn't. Remorse is for other people, and it's usually connected to empathy. Shame is for the self, and it's not connected to empathy in any way. It's all about them. It also usually has nothing to do with anything they've done. It might seem connected, but it's only connected on the surface. The thing they've been called out for is not the real focus, nor is the hurt they've caused the other person. Being called out triggers the shame of being thought of as a bad person who does bad things. It's another example of how horrible they are. This is the focus of the shame, and this thought process does not really address or even acknowledge the wrong that they've done to the other person at all, though this can be difficult to see at first. Their focus is on them, and it stays there. 
The shame experienced by truly narcissistic people is generally of tidal wave proportions and with no coping mechanisms to deal with it except their various manifestations of avoidance and denial, they live in fear of being unable to outrun this tidal wave one day. Many narcissists are actually afraid of other people too. They fear trusting anybody or caring about people. They fear allowing others to care about them. These, quote, good feelings inevitably trigger, quote, bad ones, and they are unable to deal with the emotional fallout and the confusion that follows. They enjoy somebody acting as if they care, but if someone says they care, they must be lying. If someone really does care, there must be something wrong with them. This seems to be experienced by narcissists as feelings for and opinions about the other person rather than as the self-hatred that it actually is and it's reacted to the same way. The other person is treated as the source of the confusion and they are blamed for that. Inside, the narcissist cannot understand or take ownership of their feelings and so they look around for ways that other people are causing them to feel the way that they do. Narcissists don't really understand how the world works, how other people operate, and most importantly, they don't understand how they themselves operate. So many of them are simply walking around imitating what they see others do to get their needs met and often making a big mess out of it because they don't really get it. They can't trust other people, they can't trust themselves, and they have nothing real to base anything on because of the instability of their identities. That's scary. Another thing pathologically narcissistic people are hiding is that they know something's wrong. Part of the reason that they're afraid and one of the biggest things they're hiding is the fact that they know, they are sure, they 100% believe that they are different from other people. Not just different, in fact, bad. One of the reasons the narcissist creates the false persona is because they are convinced that they are so unlovable and disgusting that they have to pretend to be somebody else in order to be accepted on any level. Many people think that that's true, that what they are hiding is their evil, abusive side, but that's actually not the case. The evil, abusive side is the second level of protection for what they are actually hiding. The weak, helpless, infantile core of unlovable, disgusting, horrible filth that they believe themselves to be. This goes way back to before they were ever abusive to anybody. This is very, very deep-seated. It doesn't have anything to do with anything they've actually done. Truly narcissistic people are the most self-loathing people on the planet, whether they act like that or not. The false persona exists for the same reason the abusive side exists. Both of these are reactions to needing to hide and protect who they really believe themselves to be. The false persona is the smiling greeter at the front door inviting you into the house and the abusive side is the 85 pound attack dog in front of all the doors in the house you're not allowed to go in. Both of these things are real in their own way and both of them are also fake in their own way. All the sides that you see are actual parts of who they could have actually been if their identity was not fractured the way that it is. But they're not stable. What is behind all those guarded doors is as close to the real truth as you can get with a pathologically narcissistic person. And the majority of the time, it's not accessible. Not even to them. That attack dog doesn't just attack outsiders who try to get in those doors. It attacks the narcissist too. That's one of the reasons they are so miserable. And that is another thing they are hiding. They are very unhappy people. As you can see from this list, narcissistic people have a shot at being the most unhappy people on the planet. It's not a surprise. They are terrified, self-loathing people who have only rigid, maladaptive, primitive coping mechanisms to deal with the really serious problems that they're facing. Consequently, they become stuck in mindsets that are harmful, self-sabotaging, damaging to themselves and others, or unrealistic, but they don't realize that. Because they're so afraid and so avoidant, and because it is a pathology, they do not realize these things, and they continue to believe other people are simply spoiling it for them somehow, either for no reason or because the narcissist's self-hatred causes them to believe that everyone else hates them as well. This usually triggers massive anger, depression, resentment, and more on top of their already existing dysregulated or completely disowned emotions. None of this is a recipe for happiness. 
Pathologically narcissistic people are in a constant state of survival mode. And because of the rigidity, the fixed beliefs, and the inability to adapt, many have lost any capacity for true happiness if they ever had it at all. They seem to view themselves as helpless boats adrift on the sea of life, unable to do anything but react to what they perceive is being done to them. Even when they seem to be taking action, investigation usually shows us that they are actually reacting to their own emotions or beliefs, which they often interpret illogically as things that other people have done to them. Anyone would be unhappy with that mindset and the rigidity of pathologically narcissistic traits makes it extremely difficult for this to be changed. The arrested emotional development that we usually see in this kind of personality makes it hard for them to even see any of this, let alone change it, and the maladaptive coping mechanisms cause them to perceive harmful intentions in anybody who tries to help. So there you have it. These are some of the biggest things that Dr. Jekyll is hiding. The important thing to remember is that by understanding what you're dealing with, you can better understand the reality of the situation, which is that this is a pathology. It's not your fault. It's not your responsibility to fix it. More than that, you don't have the ability to fix it. If someone has a life-threatening illness, for example, but they refuse to go to the doctor, you can't do anything about that decision. You can't do anything at all except decide how and if you want to move forward with the relationship. That is what educating yourself about this and understanding it helps you to do. Make informed decisions. That is how you empower yourself. Today I wanted to talk to you about something that is important in virtually all narcissistic relationships, regardless of what kind they are, and that is the idea that you can fix the narcissist or the situation with love. This is something many people struggle with, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. We always hear that love conquers all, right? It's a common sentiment in our society, and it often seems to be validated by stories we hear, sometimes things we experience, and certainly by movies and TV and media. However, people often don't realize what this actually means. Yes, it is true that love often conquers all, but only in situations that actually involve love between two people. One person loving someone and that person using them in return is not love. Codependency is not love. Trauma bonding is not love. Narcissism is not love. These things are not love. They're one-sided and usually very toxic. Unfortunately, love from one person is not enough to override the lack of love from the other. It just doesn't work. In romantic relationships, people usually believe that the pathologically narcissistic person was never loved by other partners or their caregivers, and they may vow to show this person real love with the idea that if this person doesn't know what real love is, I will show them that they can be loved. That will fix these problems. It will prove that they are worthy. It will therefore prove that I am worthy, and then they will love me. Then we can be happy. In family relationships, People are usually trying to prove that they love the narcissist in the hope that they can finally show that they have worth so they deserve to be loved and valued in return. Again, the idea is that this will fix the situation, the narcissist will love them, and the problems will be solved. In both of these situations, the person is operating on the belief that they can fix the problems and by extension the relationship and the narcissist with love. There are several problems with this thinking. The first is that it's not only not our responsibility to fix the people in our lives, but it's not possible to do so. We are only able to accept someone as they are and decide if we want them in our lives. If we don't want them in our lives as they are, then the truth is we don't really want them in our lives. We want our idea of them or our fantasy of what they could be, and that's not the same thing. However, let's put all that to the side and really look at the situation. The idea is that someone who has never known love or being valued could be saved or fixed by receiving love. On the surface, this looks like a good, solid solution. If a lack of love created the pathologically narcissistic person's problem, then an abundance of love can remedy the problem. It makes sense in this context, and narcissists themselves may even insist that this is the case but it's not true. 
You see, people usually overlook a huge hole in this logic, and that is that in order for love to be the solution, the person receiving the love has to be able to understand and recognize love in the first place. If the person has never known love, how are they going to do that? If you've dealt with a pathologically narcissistic person, you already know that they do not recognize or understand things like love, respect, consideration. They will continually insist that they're not being given these things when in fact they are being given, sometimes in huge amounts. The narcissist idea of what love is supposed to be is usually very different from what it actually is. And as a result, they don't recognize it. You cannot give somebody what they're asking for when they don't even know what it is. All that's going to result in is them never getting it. This is complicated by the fact that pathologically narcissistic people operate almost solely off of feelings, even if they don't realize it and even if it doesn't necessarily seem to be that way. Their feelings are considered facts. More than that, their feelings are considered evidence. So if they don't feel that you love them, then you don't. And it doesn't matter what you do to prove it. It's never going to be enough because feelings are facts to a narcissist. If they don't feel you love them, then you don't. And that's that. You're fighting a losing battle against the pathological self-hatred of a person with no self-worth. This often creates a vicious cycle where people just give more and more and more, hoping the narcissist will finally see and finally value them. This is extremely unlikely. And it's not about you having worth to them or not having worth to them, regardless of how it feels to you. For them, it's about the fact that they don't think they have any worth and therefore no one can ever, has ever, or will ever love them. The fact that love does not simply appear and go exactly how they think it should and feel exactly how they think it should 24 hours a day just reinforces this idea. You become just another faker, just another liar in the long list of people who have betrayed them, let them down, sabotaged them, or otherwise were not perfect. That is the biggest reason that you cannot fix or save a narcissistic person with love, regardless of whether it's your responsibility or not, which it's not, and regardless of whether it's even possible or not, which it isn't, they can't recognize it anyway. And if you've been dealing with one, then you know that by now. It's a fruitless endeavor that results in nothing but pain for both you and the narcissist. It's a frustrating, pointless, and unevolving situation that usually results in unhappy endings because you both want things from the relationship that the other person cannot give you. You can't earn the trust of someone who does not trust themselves. You cannot earn the respect of someone who does not respect themselves. You cannot win the honor of someone who does not honor themselves. You cannot win the love of someone who doesn't love themselves. It's time to let go of the idea that you can save this person. They have to save themselves. Narcissistic people are going to have to get through life the best way that they can, and so are you. The good news is that while you can't heal the narcissist with love, you can heal yourself that way. Self-love is the way to healing. Learn to let go of the fantasy of the narcissist and embrace the reality of yourself. You deserve more, and your worth is not dependent on other people's perception of your value. Accept that someone's inability to see your worth says nothing about you, because it really, truly doesn't. It says something about them. Stop worrying about what narcissists think of you. They don't even like themselves. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and via Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the book and appointment tab to go ahead and do that. I teach workshops a few times a month, so if you're interested in signing up for one of those, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day.